I know there are many other people that want to ask questions, so come on up and we will do that. But I, I, I ask to um, respond to, to something that you said about the, about the towers and that issue. It's really important to understand that the absence of proof of harm is not evidence of safety. Right. I call and it prudence avoidance. Like prudent right. avoidance. Like prudent avoidance. That's, that's very well said. And thank you again for your leadership. obstetrician in Framingham, and when I sit here and listen, the biggest thing that strikes me is that there is a huge lack of awareness on the pediatric level, because I'm also a parent, and I have a son with a learning disability, and he goes to Framingham Public Schools, and I've been made aware about Wi-Fi issues in the past year, and that's been a concern for me, and I think there's not a lot of good information about how to act as a community or as a parent to push for change. And I think a big failure is in the level of the office of the pediatrician. Because when you say child abuse, when a parent gives their kid a cell phone, the parent is completely ignorant that they are possibly harming their child. And I think of all the times I've gone to my pediatrician, and I've never really been asked about technology in my children's lives. And even when my son was struggling in school and needed to be evaluated, I was never asked about that. And so I wonder, is there a big push with the American Academy of Pediatrics to formally, either in brochure form, you know, you go into the pediatrician's office and see all of these papers that say nutrition and eat a vegetable and, you know, play outside, but you don't see anything that says, all of you are sitting here with your kids sitting on your iPad playing so they will be quiet in my waiting room. Mm -hmm. This is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then, as a practicing obstetrician, I want to keep my pregnant ladies safe. And when they come in and ask me how can I have a healthy pregnancy, I say, eat as organically as you can. And I mention about Wi-Fi, but I'm not as well aware as these risks as I am tonight. And I say, the doctor from Yale? Yes. Is he a maternal fetal medicine high-risk specialist, or is he a generalist? One. And two, in the American College of OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine, is there a big push for public awareness for pregnant women to avoid and to limit and to mandate, because many of these pregnant women are in workplace environments where they're exposed to high intensity routers, multiple devices surrounding them, and I really don't know what to tell them because I don't know what ACOG has to say about it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Janet, it's going to give you some brochures right now that you can hand out to your patients that we have worked on with Professor Taylor at Yale, right, right there. And we will um, invite you to sign on and then we'll provide you with more of them so that you can share them with your patients. I think the universe, uh, I may say higher authorities, are at play here because just this week, Dr. Sharma and I met with the Executive Committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics. They are doing a revision of their green book on the environment. They will have a chapter on cell phone radiation. We met with them, there, there was the same kind of reaction, and you as a parent and a doc have some very interesting suggestions that we're gonna take back to them, and if you would like to be an advisor to us about what you'd like to see, we'll be happy to work with you to make that happen. This I is great. You will, we'll, we'll give you the brochures. Right. We'll give you the brochures. We'll give you all the materials you can hand out, and we love feedback for other things. And in fact, <clears throat> we are a small nonprofit. You know, we really are. And so, those of you who might have the resources to copy our materials, I will tell you, Janet. Do, can you now? We have some of the doctor's advice. I hope if you will please give give them out here. The doctor's pamphlet. Yes, I have. All right. I, 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 that pamphlet has been given out in India in, I think, 12 languages. The Indian government is handing that out. Here, excuse me. And in addition, we, it's been, it's this, this one and the other one, the one I'm gonna show you here. This one here, um, you can print this yourselves, and you can make as many copies as you want. It's on our website. And it cost us, unfortunately, about 40 cents a pay to, to do it. So anybody here with a business that wants to do this and put their own name on it, we would love to have you do this. This is available on our website, and Janet will tell you how to find it, and a bunch of other materials to be given away for people to have information. 
these, we now I think we're about at 1.6 million copies around the world, and we'd love to make it available through the Board of Health. What it is is, here's why you need to be concerned about, there's the children image that, that Frank showed you. Here's the studies on sperm count, the World Health Organization statement in 2011 that's a possible human carcinogen. What Health Canada said at some about in uh, 2011, and then the practical things you can do. We're not telling you to stop using your phones. After all, phones have revolutionized our way to respond to emergencies, in medicine in particular. But we've got to start to be smart about how we use these devices. And I think there's a global understanding that's emerging now about how we can be safer with this technology. Deborah? Yes, please. Yes, yes. Um, to the uh, obstetrician who just spoke, I would um, be happy to help you, as I think we all would be, to prepare a presentation for you to present at the American Academy in all your professional associations. One of the things, this year was the first, you know, Harvard does all these continuing education for CEU things. This is the first year I was actually asked. The Addictions Conference for Continuing Education is one of the most widely attended one, and this is the first year they included addiction to technology. So I spoke at that, and um, I'd be happy to share uh, you know, the template for what I did. I think every one of us, if we can take this information into any different professional training at an educational organization, we're in. And I think that's the biggest point because I feel like so many high level specialists aren't really in the know. They're not. Like, I'm not really Yeah. I took my daughter to an ear, nose, and throat specialist for children for an issue with her hearing, and she had one sided diminished hearing. And I asked him about the association of Wi Fi and persistent neuroma, and he's an ear, nose, and throat specialist at Boston Children's Hospital. Yeah. And he did not know of any data right. that oh. might be correlating that. It's, it's and I thought to myself, there's something wrong. That's the physicians are less informed than the lay people. Well, it's very complicated because, you know, not only are physicians not well informed, the industry waffles because in the name of things like relevance, like there have been different conversations, we want to be relevant. And if all parents are giving their kids cell phones for two or three hours a day to play with, they're in the car all the time, we don't want to look like we're out of touch with how hard it is to parent today, so they back off because they're afraid to do the right thing. So that then, of course, gets replicated in terms of parents knowing themselves how to set appropriate limits with their kids. And somebody asked earlier the question, what does addiction look like? What do we mean by addiction? I can tell you when I was in Asia, I'm going back to do more research this October, but I asked that question and here's what was described to me. And the research shows the same thing. When a five-year-old who is addicted to technology, when they're upset, when they fall, when they fall off a jungle gym, when they hurt themselves, when they need stitches, when they're at the pediatric ER, they do not respond to human comfort. They cannot calm themselves down unless they are given Ninja Fruit Fly or whatever game it is they play. And now we know from using technology to look at the brains of children who have moved from play to a kind of psychological dependency to a compulsive behavior to real addiction is that they go through at age five, six, seven the same uh, cognitive and neurological withdrawal of a child who's born in fetal alcohol or is exposed to drugs with the human brain is the same part of the brain that goes through withdrawal. So we see BT <coughs> responses, we see shakes, we see unbelievable uh, rage and dysregulation and inability to calm down. And actually, um, a immersion in wilderness is the treatment of choice, actually, for kids knowing that sometimes they will need uh, small amounts sometimes of sedatives to help them gradually withdraw anti-anxiety medication. So this is very serious. It can be done. Detox happens. And there's nobody in this room who hasn't seen a child throw a horrible tantrum when the mom said, time's up, honey. And then it's so hard as a parent because it is the kind of rage you are not used to from your child. It's a very different response. I wrote my book. One of the things that brought me to the book I did is that my child, my son who's now 30, was an early gamer. And he was very talented in gaming. And I 